Hello, it's the rest day on the tour after nine pretty intense days of racing, six of them since we last saw you on ITV1. So before we get stuck into the action, let's remind ourselves where we left the race last Monday night. Well, CSC's David Zabriskie was in the yellow jersey, having surprised everybody with his debut tour ride in the opening time trial. He was the only man faster than Lance Armstrong by two seconds, while Armstrong was over a minute up on Jan Ulrich, having humiliated his chief rival by overtaking him in the space of 19 kilometers. Stage two was for the sprinters, and Tom Burnham took it with time to think about his celebration for the super slow-mo. Stage three was a bit tighter, not for Burnham, who won it again, but behind him, where Robbie McEwen was going helmet to cheekbone with Stuart O'Grady and getting himself disqualified in the process. The sprinting was spectacular as usual, but it changed nothing at the top. Zabriskie's lead over Armstrong, the same two seconds by which he was faster in the individual time trial. Now the two of them are about to go at it with their teams for company. There's no other sport in the world where individual success depends on group sacrifice the way it does in cycling, but the daily grind of teamwork is usually lost in a swarm of jerseys as each squad does its chores alongside the domestic staff of 20 other teams. The team time trial, though, makes it all crystal clear. Like families of non-uplets, each dressed in identical outfits by their mother, the teams power around the course in formation and the time is taken on the fifth man over the line. So this is where a team leader really relies on the depth of quality in his lineup. Today's team time trial course, stage four of the tour, is 67 kilometers through the Loire Valley, then over the Loire itself here, just before the finish at Blois. And it's a very tricky finish to negotiate as a nine-man team. The medieval street plan here is tight and twisty, and Lance Armstrong will know better than anyone what can go wrong in team time trials. And there's a crash in the postal team, there's a touch of wheels. Two riders are down here on the floor. One of them is van der Velde, I think. The right-hand side of the picture, I'm not sure where the other one is, Tyler Hamilton. But two riders are down. That was the 2001 team time trial, but Armstrong's squad has won this event in the last two tours. And most people think this year's supporting cast is the strongest he's ever had. You throw in the guys we've had around, Tricky, Chechu, who I think are better than they were last year. Acevedo is at least as good as he was last year. George, look at the way he rode in the Dauphine. Clearly, he's better than he was a year ago. So, I mean, the team is... I'm not worried about this team defending the jersey. I'm, I might be a little worried about the leader getting the jersey, but no, they, they know how to do their job. Well, there's the route, Tour de Blois, and over the 67-kilometer course, Liberty Seguros set the best early time, coming in with one hour, 11 minutes and 32 seconds. But with all the teams out on the road as we join the stage, CSC are fastest through the second time check at 46 kilometers. Six seconds better than Discovery, and seven seconds up on T-Mobile, who are powering towards the finish. Here comes Jan Ulrich driving the train towards the line. As they head up now, they will be better than Liberty Suguros. Then it's down to the others to match the pace. This is a big demonstration by T-Mobile because they were devastated after the individual time trial. But now they are going to tell us they are back. Alexander Vinokurov is also coming up towards the finishing time now. This is going to be a fantastic time, Paul. Take it in. Well, they're pulling themselves up to the finish line. Jan Ulrich must have done some massive turns out there in the road because there you can see Ulrich has switched off that's Garini not too far away Vinokurov is very happy with his time he's taken up sixth place there but the time they're looking to beat is the time of Liberty Seguros it's going to be very close indeed 1.11.32 is the time to beat but 1.11.15 is the time of T-Mobile so T-Mobile the team of Jan Ulrich and look at that a little clip of the hands as they go number one slot well, I'm just looking here at CSC. They look as good as Discovery Channel today. I have to say, Paul, this is going to go right down to the line. T-Mobile have done their job at every check so far. 
They certainly have, and T-Mobile have got the best time with six kilometers to go. 20 seconds faster than Liberty Seguros and 51 seconds faster than Team Fonak. Fonak then, who really we thought would have been a top three team on the day, should get in, top three team at the moment, but they will slip away as the teams Discovery and CSC come to the line. Here they come though, Floyd Landis, his face twisted in pain, hits the line, third best so far for Fonak. They've lost their first man here, this could be a sign, this is Giovanni Lombardi. He is the team sprinter, so not surprisingly, he's the first man to get popped off the back here of Team CSC. But over the final few kilometers, a man down can be a serious handicap. Now, will they be all smiles like we've seen the past two years? There is Lance, there's the time to 56.86 kilometers an hour by T-Mobile, and this is going to be even quicker than that. Lance is going to lead this Tour de France into retirement, having led his team to the fastest ever time trial in the history of the event. Here they come now, driving up to the line. Wait for the smile, what determination. 110.4, 57.31 kilometers an hour. And at the six to go sign, Team CSC still had a two second two advantage seconds, on two Discovery seconds. Saddles. That's the difference between Lance Armstrong and his uh, fellow countryman Dave Zabriskie. How ironic is that? Because if it were to finish right now, he would have doubled his lead. Now, I just see there, Phil, the sign which says two kilometres to go. Team CSC have got to get to the finish in two minutes. Two minutes, they have to ride right now at 60 kilometres an hour. And with the corners, I don't think that's possible. Well, Paul, look, number 21 is the leader of the team in the weeks ahead. That's Ivan Basso. It looks to me as though he's sitting at the back now. He's not so sure he can drive this group anymore. But the boy in yellow, Zabriskie, is itching to get through. He's such a strong man. This is very difficult through here now as we go through the S's and they approach the line. Remember, two seconds is the margin. Two seconds is the margin. Oh, oh and the yellow jersey's gone. Gone. What has happened? He's overshot the bend. Total disaster. After the yellow jersey has hit the bend well that is it that is it because he is no longer with the team his teammate just behind him managed to get around him but Dave Zabriskie has gone down very hard he will not now be able to finish with the team he will not get the same time as the team so win or lose by team CSC he has lost oh. the yellow jersey with that horrible crash at one and a half kilometers to go and it was heavy look at his shorts his jersey the Mayo zone is solid there's no one kilometer rule in a time trial he will lose the time it's a long way up this home straight at 1 10 39 they drive on now team csc heading up towards the line 39 is the time of team discovery channel it's still a little way to go they may be just outside it they've got 10 seconds to get up this straight it is a long way it is a vicious sprint but i think they'll be the wrong side of 39 anyway but it doesn't matter because the yellow jersey has passed the lance armstrong they hit the line, the two-second margin continues to haunt them. 1-10-41, it's the wrong way anyway. He would have lost it, but now he is going to slip out of the top ten, probably. Phil, that is the most unbelievable team time trial I think I have ever witnessed in my life. So, poor David Zabriskie, the consolation, if there is one, he would have lost his lead anyway, but what we would have had was Lance Armstrong and Zabriskie equal first in the Tour de France. How incredible is that? As it is, it doesn't matter because he's coming home in his own time, losing time, and that welt on the side of his thigh is beginning to look rather ugly. Dave Zabriskie, don't feel ashamed because you almost did it. But at this time, I'm afraid the master has played the master stroke. Armstrong is back in the Mayo Jean of the Tour de France. After the slow, painful ride to the finish, David Zabriskie had the slow, painful one past the press to his team car. The stage result would have done nothing to improve his mood. Even with the crash, CSC lost only two seconds to discovery. If anyone but Zabriskie had gone down, that would have been enough to hold on to the race lead. T-Mobile make up the top three on the stage. But it's Armstrong's squad that gets on the podium for the third year running, twice as US Postal, once as Discovery. And as usual, the team time trial produces wholesale changes at the top. Four Discovery riders in the top six, 
including Armstrong, now installed as race leader. Alexander Vinokurov is seventh, David Zabriskie down to ninth on the same time as his leader Ivan Basso, with Jan Ulrich 14th. Well, we said he knew the impact a crash could have on the team time trial, but Lance surely didn't think before the stage that it would take one to put him into the race lead. The yellow jersey, close though, two seconds. Close, I know. I know. We were, we were trying to watch the, the, the race in the, in the bus. Our TV was in and out, and we were just everybody on pins and needles looking at the, at the clock. And uh, We knew it was going to be close because the, the wind was uh, so favorable today that uh, difficult to make a selection, difficult to, to get big time differences, and uh, CSC was strong, you know, so tough to, tough to beat them. Tough for David Zabriski too. To crash in the yellow jersey is bad enough. To do it within 1,300 metres of the finish after a storming team time trial ride must double the misery. And Zabriski seemed no wiser than anyone else as to what caused it. I don't know what happened. Maybe the chain slipped off or it just happened so fast and I can't see a good angle on TV. It's just uh, one second happened. Well, his manager doesn't know. He doesn't seem to know himself. Chris Boardman, I mean, the shot's not very good, is it, from behind? But what do you make of Dave Zabriskie's crash? I think after we'd seen it a couple of times, it was good enough. There was basically two things that could have happened. He's either pulled his foot out or his chain's come off, because we could see he had all his weight on the crank and suddenly lost any kind of resistance, and he just went straight down. And you know what it's like to crash out in the yellow. You've crashed out of the whole race. He's just crashed out of the race lead, but it, still, he must be feeling pretty bad. Oh, to get so close, literally, in, within sight of the finish line, to have it all snatched away, it's going to probably take a couple of days for him to get over that. So Lance Armstrong is in the yellow jersey for the first time in his final tour. After the break, we're going to be back in sprinters' territory, though. Stage five from Chambord to Montagy. Hi, I'm Stuart O'Grady, and more from the Tour de France after the break. Stage five, the race is back in its normal configuration after the team time trial, which means we're most likely in for a bunch sprint at the finish. Tom Burnan is looking for his third win out of three. Robbie McEwen is just looking for sympathy. When the Australian sprinter was disqualified on stage three for headbutting Stuart O'Grady, the commissaires told him that he had no right of appeal. Well, he's lodged one anyway with the court of public opinion. The video evidence looks pretty damning for Robbie, but when we caught up with him at the team time trial, he insisted that we'd been looking at the evidence the wrong way. We're just looking at the wrong bits of it. You've got to know what you're looking for. You don't have to look at the, the head movements because they were a direct result of the first elbow that came from, from O'Grady. So, you know, I was just reacting to what came from, uh, from another rider and, uh, and I've been penalised for that. So it's, uh, no, I'm 100% positive it's a wrong decision and uh, I've been ripped off. Well, make of that what you will, and if you can make any sense of it, good luck to you. What we can say is that stage five, 183 kilometres from Chambord to Montargy, is flat and tailor-made for Robbie to try to make his point on the road, where he's a bit more persuasive. We pick it up heading into Montargy, and it's looking like a bunch finish. They're absolutely flying through here. We're gently downhill, but they're safe at the moment. Now, anybody who doesn't want to get involved better get out of this one because we're heading into the narrow streets. There's a cobble section as we head up to the kite. There's the kite. One kilometre to go. Matty White has swung off. There he is on the right-hand side. Job done for the day. He's looking to see whether Stewie O'Grady is going to come up with the goods. It's Bradley McGee on the front. This is what he wants to do. Cookies up there into third place, but so too is the green jersey. And there is Tor Hussoff, the Credit Agri call rider over on the left-hand side. And still, Phil, I cannot see Robbie McEwen. This is the corner we're talking about and they made it safely much to my amazement they have turned up now it's an uphill finish and Baden Cook has got himself right in the place here Armstrong safe in that back watch out for the third wheel the third man in white Baden Cook is now second here comes the lead out for Tom Bonin why Chucky hasn't got it Bonin is tucked over to our left and he's got the man on his wheel there from Australia uh, McEwen is behind, this is still the lead out, but it's going to be now for Isa, but here comes the lead out for, for Bonan, Bonan goes, McEwen chases him down, and now the green jersey again has hit the front, O'Grady is out of it, here comes McEwen, he's got the legs this time, Robbie McEwen is forced to the line and takes it, that 
That's revenge for you. <laughs> oh, look at that salute by Robin McEwen. That was not to the crowd, that was to the referees to say, guys, I can win these sprints. That was great revenge for Robin McEwen after being relegated from third place in their stage into tours. And what a sprint by Robin McEwen. We did say, Phil, before the start that he would enjoy that little corner at 500 meters to go. This is when weight perhaps isn't so much, but it was uphill, but this smart guy can guide himself through a minefield and he's done that. Look at the face behind on Stuart O'Grady as well. Boy, McEwen does send them at us sometimes and this is one of his best. Yes, we know, Robbie, it was pretty good, wasn't it? I think he's enjoyed that. Hello, thank you very much. This goes to prove that I am one of the top sprinters on the block, but let's look at it from the air. Well, just having a quick look at there, Tom Boonen has got a nice clear shot at the finish line, but this is the kind of sprint which is slightly uphill. You have to wait right down to the last possible moment. Boonen looked as if he had the power, but Robbie McEwen has got the kick. McEwen just wanted to get this victory. Boonen gets himself second, and Hushoft gets himself third place. What was the celebration all about? Uh, it was a bit of a double celebration, just to say I'm the fastest one here today, and... Um, my team is the one that did all the work to provide me with this opportunity. Vindication for Robbie McEwen as he does Tom Bonin out of a hat-trick. Tor Hushoff taking third place for the second time in three bunch sprints. Now Robbie says stage wins are all he's interested in from here on. And as you can see, even this stage win leaves him no higher than fourth in the green jersey competition. In the overall standings, the result changes nothing. Lance Armstrong still leads, and the nearest non-teammate is Jens Voigt of CSC, one minute, four seconds back. The closest T-Mobile man is Alexander Vinokurov in seventh. Dave Zabriskie nursing his road rash through the stages ninth, just ahead of his team leader Ivan Basso, and Jan Ulrich remains 14th. Historic Stanislas Square in Nancy, the setting for stage six, but beautiful old French towns and high-speed bunch sprints aren't necessarily a happy combination especially in the rain. And the final corner of the run-in came with a warning in the rider's road book. As we join the action, local boy Christophe Mongin is on the verge of the Tour's first successful solo breakaway, powering into Nancy, with the pack piling it on to try to pull him in. He is going to come up now to the last couple of kilometres, and he's going to still hold a very, very slight lead. These long kilometres right now will not be good for Christophe Mongin because the main field sight. will be able to judge the distance they are behind him. But it seems as if there is no organisation now by the sprinters. It's all over. This is Alexander Vinokurov is going for now it. That's a crafty little move by a man who could win the Tour de France. He's tied alive in it all up here for the T-Mobile squad. Remember, they're going home in the next couple of days. They're a German-sponsored team at 1.3 miles to go. We are now at two kilometres from the finish. Vinokurov has taken it up. And he's still got 10 seconds lead. You can see the darkness in the back there. That is the main field. They're charging through the streets of Nancy. They're less than 50 metres. And Alexander Vinokurov, Phil, is getting himself halfway across the gap. I'm not sure who he's trying to lead out for T-Mobile. But there, it is in, he's got the gap. He's got the gap over the front end of the main field. Clever rider. Oh, well, he, this is a, such a typical move by Vinokurov. Looking from the helicopter now, the first picture there we can see. See, he's going to hit the kilometre probably ahead and then Vinokurov is going to join in. There's more help on the way. The peloton have not got a hold of this race yet. I hope he doesn't hesitate like he did on the final stage of Paris-Nice. As soon as he catches Mongin, he has to go straight over the top. Otherwise, he's going to get caught up by the acceleration of the sprinters. Well, somewhere above us, we will see one kilometre to go. Christophe Mongin has seen the two riders catch him now. He will have to take a deep breath and try and work with them. There's the kilometre kite. There are now three riders. What a dramatic finish this is. Oh, oh and, and he's, he's gone, gone his overshot. Vinokurov skids and misses him. There's another crash, a massive pile up on that bend. And that is going to give the victory to the breakaway. They just lost their concentration here. But it looks as though Armstrong again on the late crash has gone through on the inside with all the skills. I'm trying to nail this rider, Paul, but it looks like a rider. Is it from Fasa Borsolo? It is. It's not Fabian Cancellara, I don't think, but it's a big rider. It could be Kim Kirk and this of Luxembourg who's clear. We pull back from the shadows of the arch on Stanislav Square. And now the rate there, and there is Robbie McEwen. He's down, uh, picking up the bits. And there is the fallen Christophe Monjam. What the way to end the day here. 
as uh, we need to cut back to the beginning here he looks okay a little bit stunned Gerard Port the doctor is there as well this rider whoever he is is about to win at the stage Vinokurov skidded missed the crash and he's coming again the champion of Kazakhstan and the legs on that big man I've got a feeling it might be Kim Kirken that's who we're going for he has got the victory on the line it's not Kim Kirken but he's got the victory on the line and Vinokurov gets a second and the rider who's won is Lorenzo Bernucci of Italy. Well, that was an unbelievably timed move by Bernucci coming across there. It really was an incredible move as well. There is Lance Armstrong, but I think, Phil, if we look back at the results, the referees will give everybody there the same time. Armstrong in that group not showing any emotion at all on his face that crash was well inside the last kilometer of racing well inside the last three kilometers of racing so i feel sure that the judges will give everybody here the same time right let's have a look at the stage result lorenzo bernucci takes his first ever win in the tour de france just ahead of alexander vinokurov but more interesting is the gap from vinokurov back to the rest of the field seven seconds on his team leader jan ulrich who came in 19th Lance Armstrong was 32nd and even Basso 75th. Add in the 12 second time bonus Vinokurov picked up for second place and he took 19 seconds off the other big names. The more immediate glory though to Bonucci, 25 years old and second place in a stage of the Tour of Switzerland, his best result prior to this one. And here's an insight into the priorities of your average rider. With men on the ground all around him, no sooner has Bonucci's fellow Fassa Bortolo rider Fabian Cancellara steadied himself at the back of the crash and he's on the radio shouting encouragement to his colleague up the home straight. The man who started the pile-up, Christophe Monjan, eventually rolled in 128th with nothing to show for his efforts except the beginnings of a beautiful black eye. With all due kudos to Lorenzo Bonucci, the big news of the stage was its effect on the overall standings and Vinokurov's sheer nerve has moved him up into third just behind George Hincapie. A minute and two seconds behind Armstrong instead of the one minute 21 he was before the stage. Jan Ulrich finished in a group ahead of Armstrong, but because the split was caused by a crash inside the last three kilometres, he got the same time, so his deficit doesn't change. Still comfortably in yellow than Armstrong, but perhaps a bit less comfortable than he was at the start of the day, because Vinokurov's unpredictability is the one thing that Discovery's meticulous team machine can't factor into its calculations. Do you think he's the main man at T-Mobile now? Because Jan Ulrich was saying before the tour, you're never going to know who's the captain. Is that important? I mean, we have to ride our race, you know? And uh, I, 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 not, to, not to, to sound like a snob, but I mean, we have to, we, we had to prepare ourselves to get here, and, and, and now we have a strategy, and we have a great team behind us, and we're going to ride our race. And, and ultimately, if, if, you know, the secret leader comes along from another team and beats us, then we lose. But I think right now we're, we're happy with what we have. Stage 7 takes the tour into Germany, and a German rider had the distinction of being first across the border, Fabian Wegmann of Gerolsteiner. But he was swept up long before the finish in Karlsruhe, and as we join the race, the whole field is together. In two lines now, Licky Gas over on the left-hand side. You could see Francis de Jeu were losing the line, so they're smoothing across into the middle of the road. Still, Bradley McGee is waiting for the last moment. He's the kind of rider who's got a great lead-up. But look at Boonen right up there, moving up through the middle onto the tail there of Jan Kersipu in the black, blue and white jersey. The champion of Estonia's got Tor Hushoff right on his wheel. Boonen rides at this minute in 12th position in this pack from the helicopter. The Leaky Gas boys still feel the confidence in Pagliarini because they've got to control the front of the bunch. Toe two for Tor Hushoff here. Off to the left is Bradley McGee now and locked on his wheel is Baden Cook. That's the big Australian double. That's McGee in the white. McCook is behind him at second and third to those boys. This is going to be one terrific rush for the line. Robert Foster's trying to get in for Gerald Steiner now. Tor Hushoff is moving up as they start to fan across the road. They're looking for one kilometre to go. They're still looking. In fact, they've come inside. There's oh, 500, 500 metres to go. go. We've gone bowling past the one kilometre sign. McGee has got Cookie on his wheel, but there's a big launch coming from Kersi Poo in the middle and Tor Hushoff. Yes, that is Hushoff on the right there, but he's checked himself, and this is a brilliant lead out by Bradley McGee. 
McGee has now got Baden Cook. He launches Cook at the finishing line as Cook now makes the run for the line. On the rails there, there's been a crash, and in fact, Perlal has gone on the left. And look at McEwen on the inside. Magnus Backstead's got his wheel. Here comes Magnus Backstead to the line now. I think McEwen's held him off. McEwen on the line thinks he's got it, that for sure. The big surprise there. Absolutely no sign in the top five of Tom Bonan. He was out of that today, but there was a nasty crash there. I know Furlant was involved, but there was two riders went, and as they come through here, well, Robbie McEwen didn't cause that. There's the crash. That is Galvez, in fact, uh, being treated by Gerard Port. He looks totally disgusted, laying the bike down, walking away. Looks quite cool, actually. And this is the other bike, and look at this. Furlan is not happy, blaming Galvez. Galvez doesn't want to know about it. Let's have a look at the sprint. Look at this now, and there's no doubt about it. McEwen has got it, but that is a great sprint by Magnus Backstead. Big Maggie is back in the big time with that sprint finish. There's no doubt of that. There's confirmation of the result, and it needs confirming on this stage because that was not an easy sprint to follow. Robin McEwen took it, though, ahead of Liquid Gas Bianchi's Magnus Backstedt and Bernhard Eisel of Frances de Jure. Behind the main action, the Commissaires were examining the replays of that crash in the home straight, though, and so was Chris Borkman. Well, he circled Alan Davis for you here. You can see he's desperately trying to find a way out. He moves right and I think inadvertently takes out Galvis and Furlan. Well, the judges didn't agree. They decided it was out of order and relegated him to 173rd position. Bonin 2, McEwen 2, all square in stage victories between Belgium and Australia. So at the end of seven stages, Lance Armstrong will be carrying the yellow jersey up the first climb of the tour worth the name. And the name is the Col de la Schlucht. Stage 8 coming up after the break. Hello, my name is Fabian Wegmann and you can see more from the Tour after the break. Oh, who I think will win the Tour de France. <laughs> Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. Armstrong. Lance Armstrong will win the 2005 Tour. Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. Yeah, I won't lie, Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Lance Armstrong. Armstrong. How could you not pick him to win it? Jan Ulrich. With the Tour heading back into France for Stage 8, about the only major rider loyally picking Jan Ulrich to win this race is the one who looks best placed to take over from him as Lance Armstrong's chief rival. Alexander Vinokurov is the one man who's had the nerve to attack Armstrong so far, and as a result, he's currently lying third, a minute and two seconds behind the race leader and 34 seconds ahead of his own team leader. Jan Ulrich is in 13th place, 1.36 behind Armstrong, and 10 seconds behind Ivan Basso, who's lying in 9th. Well, the Stage 8 route provides some opportunities for Armstrong's challengers to attack, especially towards the finish, where there's a second category climb 15 kilometres from the line, and that could set up a furious downhill finish into Gérard May. In fact, it looks similar to Stage 9 in 2003, where Vinokurov picked up almost a minute on Armstrong and the rest of the field in one of a series of attacks he launched the last time he rode the Tour. Just look at this now, this is such a typical move by Alexander Vinokurov and he's free to fly. Vinokurov coming up the home straight, it's been another great battle, another late attack and he's got time back on Armstrong, he's winning. Here he goes again, Vinokurov just will not lay down today. And the man from Kazakhstan, well, he really does bring the Tour de France to light. He's at it again. Here he goes. Go get him, Alex. You know, I think the one man Armstrong really fears is Vindakurov, and there he is, right in his slipstream. Well, the first successful attack of the day came from Peter Veining, a Dutchman on the Rabobank team. As we join the action, he has a lead of a minute 37 on the main field, Four kilometres to go to the top of the Col de la Schlucht and another 16 down the other side to the finish. Vinokurov, the little terror, is in third place. He is looking for the move now. This could be where he is planning an attack. And look at Lance. Lance Armstrong is not going to let him out of his sight this time. Vinokurov, the acceleration has forced Armstrong to come out and play. Well, that's Salvadelli trying to nail down the gap. Armstrong not panicking, but Vinokurov, true to his word, he really is the dark invader, well, isn't he? He's looking to try and see if there's any weakness in Armstrong's armour. What a super bike rider. He's always taking the race to himself, and haunting him just behind there is also Jan Ulrich. Here comes an attack now from Christoph Morrow. 
They may not chase him with such enthusiasm. Well, they're not too worried about Christophe Moreau as he goes inside of the 20-kilometer to go banner because he's a man who... No, another move here by Alexander Vinokurov. He's going again. Just what he wants, somebody else to draw the sting, and he's gone. And this time, no, forget it. This time, Lance has reacted like last time. This time, it's Armstrong himself in person chasing everybody down. And look at that, they've caught the group of three riders who are halfway across the gap. And I tell you what, it looks as if there's a little bit of daylight there in between Alexander Vinokurov and Lance Armstrong. He's taking his time to pull this one back. Well, one Antonio Fletcher has had the legs to try and join in there. He's jumped onto the back, the others have gone off. Uh, but Christoph Moreau joined by Alexander Vinokurov. What a great bike racer he really is. He's not going to take defeat lying down at all. Armstrong is very, very wise there. He may have lost 19 seconds on the road to Nancy, but he's going to mark that boy now. Yeah, but Big Jan is there as well. He's right on the tail of Lance Armstrong. You can just see the pink jersey moving up. He's being very attentive. Trying to lighten this load as much as possible, <laughs> throwing out the sandbags here. Yeah, that is amazing, isn't it? Now, this is Andreas Cloden. Who would have believed that? Well, I certainly wouldn't have believed it because he was riding so badly in the Dauphiné Libre, and this has got to be a tentative. I can't believe his form has become from nothing to absolutely magnificent in 12 days. But at the moment, Cloden has found his legs, and up comes the reaction. And the rider from Rabobank there is Dennis Menchoff, who's gone forward as well. Well, Cloden, a fair way down in the overall standings, almost two and a half minutes behind Lance Armstrong. He started the day in 24th. We talked about the triptych, the trio of Basso. riders who could attack, and Armstrong now being attacked by Basso. Everybody seems to want to go up the road. Basso is gone. Armstrong is watching them spin around. He's still sitting by Jan Ulrich. Not sure he's getting such a good idea now. Ulrich is going to have to catch up as well. This is an amazing showdown. I never expected this on the climb today. You know, this is the only way they're going to beat Lance Armstrong to launch attack after attack, just keep going. But he's actually pretty cool here. He said, right, Big Jan wants to win this Tour de France as well. I'll just sit on his wheel and see where he's going to go. Well, this has to be a surprise. I'm not sure Lance will have written this one into his calculations, in all honesty. This is a big moment in this rider's young life. It's probably a big moment in that chap's young life too. As we now look at Cloden, second on the mountain, heading up towards the summit. And he looks good, his pedalling style is smooth, he looks comfortable on the machine. All he's going to face himself up to now is a very rapid descent. A bit of confusion at the front there, all the motorbikes want to get the first shot they've had of this man there so far this season, because he's never really been at the front end of the main field anywhere, apart from the stage of the Bayern Munich Rundfahrt. Look at this man, his tongue locked in the right-hand side of his mouth there concentrating eyes just staring at the summit and being giving himself a feeling they are drawing me in Cloden has gone he's going to try and out sprint him he's going to he didn't know he was coming and he's going to really kick himself for that because look at that 10 meters in the line Cloden is over first the two riders over the top together now it's a full ball down to Gerard Mer. Well, I tell you what, their advantage is not very much over the top of the climb. Race radio just crackled through and gave confirmation that the lead of those two riders was only 15 seconds, and that is not very much. Well, the attacks petered out after Clurden left the Armstrong group behind to chase down Veining, and as the pair of them approach the one-kilometre banner, it looks like Germany against the Netherlands for the stage win. Well, this is a skillful tactic by the rider from Holland. He's learnt an awful lot in just a week in his first Tour de France. He stopped working with the leader. He's going to just wait and take the risk of them catching up. Cloden is racing for time. He's thinking of the future in the Tour de France. Wienen is thinking of about 800 metres in the Tour de France. And that will be his first ever stage win. And I'll take my hat off to Cloden. He's not made any effort to force the other rider through. No, he knows that what he's got to do is ride for time. It's so important for him this afternoon. He's going to move himself up. It's 30 seconds they've back to the main it, group. It. So it's one of these two riders is going to win the stage. They've got it. Now, Wienen has is obviously going to come out of the slipstream he'll be the fresher of the two he made the move right at the base of the Col de la Schlucht and he stayed away until Cloden stole the prize off him 10 metres from the top and now he's forced the German rider to open up the sprint he's going to have to wait oh has he got it look at the look in his eye he's got this he'll move round him at the very last minute which side is he going to go now here he comes his first ever victory in his first ever oh did he get it Paul I don't know well that's a Photo film. That is a photo. Side by side, those riders were 
as they came across the line, and I don't think either of them knew who got the win. Jörg Jansk on the far right of our picture here, Cadell Evans on the far left in the red jersey, Vinokulov is looking for a tie bonus. There's a third place tie bonus at stake as he starts to come out of the attack. Here, Christoph Wolf comes on the right, Valverde, and also Jens Voigt, and he's been washed away, Vinokulov. I think it's going to be Valverde who gets third on the line and a very small tie bonus. Well, the judges on the line did eventually confirm Peter Vaining as the winner, but looking at the photo, it's not entirely clear how Ned Bolting went in search of clarification. Here is the equipment that determined who was the winner, and this is the man who operated the equipment. Bruno, how did you work out who won that stage? OK, just let me show you on the screen. OK, so you just have to zo zoom in between the two riders. So here's the first wheel. and That's Vaining's wheel? Yeah, sure. And you can see there is one pixel between the two riders. So there is less than 1,000 of seconds between the two riders. And there it is spelled out. Peter Vaining gets his first ever tour win ahead of Andreas Clerden. The pair of them finishing 27 seconds ahead of the chasing bunch, led in by Alejandro Valverde, with Jens Voigt fifth and Jan Ulrich sixth. Behind them, Vinokurov, Armstrong and Basso were all in the same group of 31 riders. None of the big names, of course, was interested in chasing Peter Vaining, but kudos to him nonetheless for getting in the right break and having the legs to ride away from it. Peter, your first professional win, your first Tour de France. What sort of a feeling is that? Yeah, it's a really uh, special feeling, uh, of course. Uh, yeah, I was fighting the whole day for it, and, uh, and, I, and I win it. Uh, it's unbelievable. Now, the big question of Stage 8 is where were Lance Armstrong's teammates? And if you're him, the answer's not very encouraging. The top place discovery rider was the youngest, Yaroslav Popovic, in a group that lost 1 minute 25. He was alongside Jose Acevedo and George Hincapi. The other five, including the winner of this year's Giro d'Italia, Paolo Savoldelli, lost nearly three minutes on what was barely a warm-up for the Real Mountains. Well, he looked happy enough on the podium, but I suspect the smile will last as long as it takes him to escape the last camera and get on the team bus to start the inquest. Because although the time gaps are mostly unchanged, the top of the overall standings suddenly looks much more like a real race and less like a lap of honour for him. There are three CSC riders in the top six, Jens Voigt, Bobby Julich and Ivan Basso. And there are two team mobiles, Vinokurov, who remains third, and Jan Ulrich, who's up to sixth. Behind them, Andreas Klerden, who had a disastrous opening time trial, has ridden himself into the top ten and confirmed that Team Mobile have a third weapon to employ against the defending champion. What's wrong with the team? That's a great question. I don't know. I mean, uh, perhaps we've uh, been a little too active in the race, worked a little too much. Maybe the guys are tired. I, I can't really comment without actually sitting down with them and saying, what's wrong with you? <laughs> How did you feel? I mean, was, what's the problem? Were, were you... Was it your breathing? Was it your legs? Was it the rhythm? Was it the, the climb? It's a strange climb too, you know, to start, uh, I mean, it's a long climb, but not very steep. So you're able to keep 30, 40, 50 guys there and they can, they can take shots at you from the back and it's hard to follow those. Well, you have to take Lance Armstrong at his word and uh, the word doesn't sound very encouraging as far as his support goes. No, he looked like a man who was rattled to me for sure. That is not what you would want. He can be completely isolated and at the top of a second category climb too. I would say I can see no tactical advantage of that, so not a good day for Lance. Four CSC riders in the top ten now, three T-Mobile riders. They're all starting to mass around Lance Armstrong. We'll take a break and we'll be back with more climbing on stage nine. Hi, I'm Peter Laning. There will be more after the break of the Tour de France. On stage eight, on a moderate second category climb in the Vosges Mountains, Lance Armstrong was more isolated than he's ever been on the giant slopes of the Alps or the Pyrenees. On stage nine, the mountains are one grade tougher. If his rivals are as strong and his team as weak once again, he could be in big trouble. And there's the stage nine battleground, 171 kilometers from Gérard May de Moulouse, with six climbs, including the Grand Ballon and the Ballon d'Alsace. There was bad news for T-Mobile early in the stage when Jan Ulrich came off on the first descent and had to be paced back into the race by four teammates. But the news was even worse for David Zabriskie, the first yellow jersey wearer of this year's race, finally succumbing to the injuries he sustained in that crash during the team time trial on stage four. Rabobank's Danish rider Michael Rasmussen, who started the stage in the King of the Mountains jersey, attacked almost from the flag and took all six summits with little or no company. 
Behind him, Jens Voigt, a minute behind Armstrong, remember, in second place at the start of the stage, set off on an attack of his own and was joined by Christoph Moreau. At the front of the main field, the Discovery Outriders were back in formation. But the show of strength was largely ceremonial, as they showed no real interest in wasting undue energy on either Rasmussen or Voigt. So as we join the race, Rasmussen is homing in on a superb solo stage win. It has been an exhibition of terrific bike riding over all of the mountains of this region in first place. He won all the prizes along the route except one small prize. He gave that to the rider who dared to join him for a short distance and then he dispatched him back to the field. It's a little bit of a lonely ride but he should start to feel good pretty now. Uh, pretty much now as this massive crowd in Malouz cheer him all the way home. It's a corridor of noise that this rider is going through, urging him up to the finishing line. They realise how brave this man has been here this afternoon. They realise what an effort he's had to put in to survive off the front on a very difficult day through the Vosges. For nearly four and a half hours, they've watched him on the television at the finishing line. Now they can see him in person as he salutes the crowd. He gets his first ever stage win. He could not have imagined that was the way it was going to be when he left around midday today from the town of Jaromer. Well, now we have to wait for Jens Voigt to come in with his, his compatriot for the afternoon, Christoph Moreau. And I've just cast my mind back and forgotten that for many, many years, Moreau and Voigt rode for the same Freddy Agricole team. We drive up to the finishing line now. I don't think Jens is going to even try to go by him as they come to the line. Christophe Moreau, the Frenchman, has certainly found his old form again. They used to be teammates, as Paul has said. They're now rivals, where well, I think today they're teammates again. As they come up to the line, three minutes has passed by on the clock, and Christophe Moreau takes second. Voigt is third. The clocks have started now. Let's wait for Armstrong. The main field are being led home still by Discovery Channel. We mustn't forget that the winner of the stage is Michael Rasmussen. Second place on the stage going to Christoph Moreau. Third place going to Jens Voigt. And Jens Voigt, I think, right now has done just enough to be the new yellow jersey here at the Tour de France. Well, Voigt has done most things in his cycling career, but we love him. That was a great ride by Jens. Now he's got to wait. These are nervous moments, of course, to see just if he is the next Maillot Jaune of the Tour de France. This is the big lead out. This is David Moncoutier on the front, taking over the pacemaking now. It's Cedric Vasseur up into third place. Is Stuart O'Grady he wants this four points for this place here. Is for fourth place here at the end of the stage is going to move him very close to the top end of the green jersey race. He's there, looking over his shoulder. There are not very many top sprinters in this group. As Stuart O'Grady is lined up, it's still Cedric Vasseur all over the machine. O'Grady's waiting. There's a challenge coming from Leaky Gas up through the middle there, but O'Grady's still waiting. He's an experienced track rider when it comes down to sprinting at the end of a race like this and he wants to make sure he gets himself maximum points here's the explosion coming down the right hand side the Aussie's going for it O'Grady's trying to get himself fourth place on the stage it's going to be so important